Welcome to the Final Girls Podcast. This is Anna, co-founder of the Final Girls Collective and your podcast host. If you're new to the show, every season we explore the intersections of horror film and feminism, looking at a particular trope in depth and how it's going and how it's been presented throughout film and TV history. Over the next few months, we are talking about the most elegant of movie monsters, the vampire. In each episode, I'm joined by a special guest to dive deep into a vampire movie or two. We've covered a whole bunch of Dracula versions, 70s gems that go from weird to exploitative to semi-pornographic. We're jumping from the colorful lesbian vampires of the 70s to a peak moment for vampire horror films, the 1990s. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing a film that feels appropriately moody, meditative, and gloomy. Abel Ferrara's philosophical vampire film The Addiction turns 25 this year, and we'd be remiss not to celebrate the anniversary of such a bizarre, beautiful, and fascinating film. Indie favorite actress Lily Taylor plays a New York philosophy grad student who gets turned into a vampire after getting bitten by one, and then tries to come to terms with her new lifestyle and frequent craving for human blood. It also stars Annabella Sciorra as the vampire who bites her, and Christopher Walken is an ancient bloodsucker with a penchant for philosophical rants. I'm joined in this episode by writer and curator Tara Judah, the cinema producer at Watershed, and commissioning editor for our own Bloody Woman film journal. This season is made possible with the support of Arrow Video, who bring you the very best in cult horror and genre films, specializing in deluxe home entertainment editions. Their collection now spans more than 500 titles, and throughout the season, we're recommending a new film. And throughout the season, we're recommending a film that we love from their vast connection in every episode. And this week, our pick is well, The Addiction which is beautifully shot and was re-released by Arrow Video on a 4K restoration just this year. If you're new to the podcast, please know that we discuss the films in depth, pretty much from the very beginning. And if you're averse to any discussion about a film before you watch it, consider this your spoiler warning. If you need a little bit convincing that vampires and philosophy and black and white moody shots of New York do go together, then I will leave a timestamp in the show notes of when we actually get into the nitty gritty spoilers. With that said, please enjoy our discussion about Abel Ferrara's The Addiction. Tara, how are you? It's so nice to speak to you on the podcast again. It's great to be back, Anna. Thank you so much for inviting me on. It's always a joy to talk to you. We're always so formal, as though we don't talk quite often. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, my attempt at a professional voice. <laughs> yes, it's, it's also mine, but it's way too early in the morning to be professional. Uh, <laughs> we were just talking about cats. Yes, and... um. As per usual, I do apologize if my cat makes his own contribution and his thoughts on the addiction known in the background. That's fine. I'd be really interested, actually, to hear Vlad's thought on the addiction. Um, I, I, I really genuinely would. <laughs> Don't encourage him. He will hear it and then he will not shut up. <laughs> um, so to kick straight into it, Tara, um, you pick this film to talk about. So what is your relationship with the addiction and with the cinema of Abel Ferrara? It's funny because I don't actually have, um, I don't have like a, a really good answer to that in the sense that I'm not an Abel Ferrara scholar. I don't, I, I kind of haven't watched all, I haven't even watched all of his films and I haven't watched them all multiple times. So um, I think it's more that I am curious about the films of Abel Ferrara. Um, and the ones that I've seen have really stuck with me. And so the opportunity to watch and think a little bit more, um, I guess, kind of focused on, on his work is always welcome for me. Um, and, I, and I think this film is fascinating. Um, 
I think one of the things I like most about Abel Ferrara's films actually is that they don't 100% work for me. They're not, they're not clear cut gene pieces of genius. I, I know a lot of people have that opinion, but I actually think that he's incredibly talented filmmaker and incredibly interesting uh, mind that comes through in his sort of uh, moral project. But also <laughs> that, um, but also that I think that his, his films sometimes are a maybe a bit there's bits about them that are messy or a little bit kind of um not kind of slick enough and i i like that imperfection i think that there's there's it it, it sort of shows the signs of a mind trying to wrestle with things and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and so what do you make of the addiction kind of with within that framework of approaching his work so first of all i just want to say that this film is visually remarkable mm -hmm. um it is probably one of the top five films in terms of shadows in cinema. I mean, really just so brilliantly. That is a big statement. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but in terms of like shadow and light, I mean, mm. I really think that that's where this film is at its greatest success mm -hmm. is the, the way that he uses the, the lighting and the photography and the framing um, to, to kind of show us uh, about his character. And also, I think it's a really clever idea in terms of how to make a high concept film on a low budget or in a, a kind of lo-fi way. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a, a sense of realism and verisimilitude because of that. Uh, but it also means that you can kind of like get away without worrying too much about hokey effects because you don't mm -hmm. need to worry if the color of the blood isn't any good because yeah. it's all in black and white. Mm -hmm. um, so it serves the, the purpose of the film on multiple levels to shoot it this way. Um, and it also in terms of the philosophical and historical context, which I'm sure we'll come on to. But but it, it very much is beautiful to look at in that sense. And it's very striking visually. Um, you know, it reminds me of, of lots of early cinema. I think that, you know, he took lots of lessons from, you know, Hitchcock, Orson Welles, these kinds of like mm -hmm. templates for how to use that sort of like, even I guess like film noir and kind of classic Hollywood cinema. It reminded me a lot of those in terms of the lighting and the staging um, of the, of everything in the frame. Mm -hmm. So I, I absolutely love that about the film. In terms of the the narrative, I think it kind of fits more into that sort of like um, Jim Jarmusch uh, sort of hipster vibe. And I quite like the, like, I mean, I'm not just thinking actually about Only Lovers Left Alive, but actually thinking about his earlier films like um, Stranger Than Paradise. And also mm -hmm. thinking about uh, films like Catherine Bigelow's um, Near Dark, like just that kind of idea of like slightly more realistic lo-fi vampires. It also made me think of Dead Man. I think that, you know, Ferrara has a very cinematic mind and I think there's always lots of references in his films or lots mm -hmm. that you can read into it anyway whether or not they were intended they were definitely there for me um so I found it very rich in that sense I also really loved the the main character I think she, mm. you know she's re she's really brilliant she performs really well um and and it was also nice to see <laughs> totally like shocked not by Edie Falco but by the second Sopranos actor turning yes! up <laughs> I was like <laughs> <Me> oh <too. laughs> It was like, wait a minute, because he's in such a minor role. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and and when, when really, you know, obviously this was before Sopranos, so, you know, they weren't that famous then. But when you see really famous actors in very small roles in films, it's always uh, a quite, quite a kind of take you back moment. So I, that was just something small that I really enjoyed. About yeah, me too. <laughs> I was actually, I was hoping to bring it up later on, but it, I did do a little double take when Michael Imperioli showed up in that small role. It's like, oh my God, it's Sopranos <laughs> pre-reunion. <laughs> I know because because Edie Falco's in it you're like oh right okay well I can get mm -hmm. past you know she's not and then you're like but wait Christopher is outside the church <laughs> handing out brochures so what's going on here <laughs> um so that was also very enjoyable and a kind of like mm -hmm. not relevant to the actual film but just as a, a nice thing about watching it in this contemporary context mm -hmm. kind of way um but yeah I also like I, I mean you know I find the thing about philosophy and I'm sure we can we can have quite a bit of a discussion about this mm -hmm. but philosophy and cinema is both enjoyable and also grating because yeah. on the one hand cinema lends itself so well to philosophy like just it's just a perfect marriage you know there's mm -hmm. a reason why people uh write extensive dissertations and philosophical dissertations on cinema and vice versa because those two things do go together really well it's a wonderful way of visually imagining um philosophical context but I also find it grating sometimes because it does feel like it can feel a little bit like film student-y or like mm -hmm. um, kind of clunky sometimes. And, you know, it, it's I guess it's that thing of like 
how deep you want to go with the philosophy. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a philosopher, so I, I kind of like get the references, but I can't like go deep on Heidegger's, you know, being mm -hmm. in nothingness. But when you, when, I mean, you know, just even the bringing up of concepts like Heidegger and mm. things like that, they're very, and you know, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and Sartre, like they, you know, they're all piled in there. It, it's very heavy. It kind of has a weight to it. Um, yeah. But I, I think in this film, um, where it, where that is, I guess, maybe a bit more interesting and potentially also like controversial for some viewers um, is also in the kind of use of, of footage from, of pictures from the Holocaust. Yeah. And I want to get into that in a bit, but, um, but I want to start first by picking up something that you mentioned earlier, and it's really about our protagonist, about Kathy. Uh, you mentioned that you really liked her. What did you like about her? Did she work for you and did Lily Taylor's performance work for you? Yeah, Lily Taylor's performance definitely worked for me. <laughs> she, she plays this really well. Um, I just really, I think I actually really bonded with her anger. Mm. Um, there, there's something, first of all, she's, you know, it's quite unusual for an actress to at the same time be as beautiful as all actresses inevitably are, mm -hmm. but also somehow be styled so that they kind of look ordinary. Yes. Um, and so I, I, I don't want, I'm not commenting at all on her her, her as an actress um, and obviously she is very beautiful but I just mm. mean that they've made her look very ordinary somehow in this film and that really really adds a lot of weight to it particularly because that initial interaction with her and the vampire that bites her yes. um, is Isabella Scura who's just mm -hmm. like you stunning. know absolutely stunning and she's dressed like the kind of typical gorgeous vampire as yes. well like that idea of um, vampires being very stylish being mm. you know very kind of beautiful and, and put together and well-groomed. And then, yeah, it, you know, our, our protagonist is the opposite. She's like a kind of gawky grad student mm. who, you know, and as the film goes on, she gets dirtier. Like her hair is just like really matted and mm. dirty and greasy. And she kind of doesn't, can't be, you know, kind of looks gaunt and, but in a really ordinary way, like in a way that you would just think, oh yeah, that student just is working really hard on their dissertation and isn't kind of keeping good hygiene. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, she she sort of has this sort of uh, vibe of a, a deep intellectual intensity. But mm -hmm. as you mentioned, Lily Taylor is probably one of those few actresses who are very, very beautiful, but have consistently um, taken on roles or kind of, found ways of toning down their natural beauty or kind of making making herself seem ordinary if that's what the character required and and it makes sense with with Kathy because like you say she is she's an introverted bookish student who's just working in the library like her life is not a glamorous New York life She's, you know, wearing her Doc Martens and her jeans and going from lectures to the library and back to her apartment. There's nothing kind of over the top exciting or cinematic about her life. No, exactly. Um, and, and that contrast is just, you know, really well drawn, I think, from the start. And then that's, you know, so I found and I found that uh, unlike a lot of and I like vampire movies, so this is not a dig at them, but unlike a lot of vampire movies where um you know the kind of the vampire once they're bitten they sort of go through this metamorphosis but they often become like this really kind of strong and and then kind of um oligarchical it's almost like they kind of rise up what i quite liked was that she just for the most part of the film i mean not for maybe the third act but for the most mm. part of the film she just becomes really angry yes <laughs> and she's she's really um she's not a she's neither afraid nor powerful there's mm. something in that that i really like that she's she's got elements of both but actually instead of embodying one of those emotions or one of those kind of archetypes she's actually quite a complicated character um and that's also played out really well in the kind of um you know moments where her face is half shrouded in shadow mm. and half in light this kind of sense of that inner turmoil but she's just struggling with the sense of humanity and in a way that does work with the philosophical underpinnings of the film because mm. obviously if you are studying philosophy all your questions are about being and humanity and ethics and you know all of those sorts of things so um in that sense i actually thought that like it of course it makes sense to have the philosophical conceit um mm. to fit with vampires and and to make it ordinary is like that's the thing that really makes it work interesting and um, let's talk a little bit about her transformation. So after she's bitten and she goes on the prowl, 
um, what do you make of the way that she actually embodies being a vampire? Especially, I found it quite interesting the way that Ferrara films the attacks and films the, you know, the, the violence of being a vampire. Yeah, the violence of being a vampire is really interesting in this film. So the the initial attack um, where she's bitten, actually, I just want to quickly talk about because, yes. I, because that that scene is just, you know, really quite remarkable. I could probably mm. just watch that sequence over and over and over again. I completely agree. And actually, <laughs> I was re-watching it this morning before we started recording, being like, I just want to make sure <laughs> that I've yeah. seen all the bits. It's gorgeous. And it's also very seductive and violent. And at the same time, there's some there's some interesting exchanges between Casanova, who which is uh, Annabelle Annabelle Sciorra's character, and Kathy, where she is asking for submission before she's bitten, even though she just has kind of grabbed her and and taken her to this weird alleyway. Yeah. So this is what's really fascinating um, is that that question about. Um acceptance or refusal or power like that power dynamic between them when the biting happens and 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 then kathy emulates this in every one of her attacks yes. this kind of idea of like you you have to stop me like mm. the other person has to stop the violence um and i think you know obviously this is where the kind of philosophical stuff starts to come in but what's amazing in that first sequence where kathy is bitten is the the way that ferrara um frames it and uses the shadow which I, I talked about and this is this is where for me the shadow was just like 100 percent like bang on is mm. that this this concept of we've got all these grids which are the reflections of things of shadows of things around them the bars that they're you know like um of the in the alleyway and everything and so there's all these kind of crisscrossing grids and their shadows are uh projected onto the faces of both of the women um mm. while they're in this kind of encounter about who has the power please is not something that's going to stop me like what would stop a perpetrator what are the, what are the kind of what are the boundaries mm -hmm. and the reason it's really fascinating is because they've got soft boundaries projected onto their faces they've got bars imprisonment um and the kind of like constraint is literally projected onto mm -hmm. their their skin but those boundaries are not are not tangible they're soft boundaries because they're projections and so this really asks questions about like how we project boundaries onto each other. And if they're not tangible, if they're theoretical, so if they're philosophical boundaries, then, you know, where where do they dissolve and where do they hold up? Um, and, and so there's this whole question around like, what is the, what is the, the, the kind of um, precipice of a soft boundary and how do you cross over and, and, and who who has the power to, to say yes or no in that instance. And so that encounter is like, you know, sort of sets up the whole film mm. and this idea of like um, where, where consent lies. And actually it's a really is a largely a film about the questions of um, consent and violence, I think, mm. because even in some of the attacks that she, she takes out, she sort of picks her victims quite carefully. Like, yeah. you know, this lovely anthropologist that she comes upon in the library and, mm -hmm there's consent in so far as they get talking they agree to go back together and then you know that typical kind of almost rape narrative kind of comes out of Kathy's mouth well what did you expect to happen you know yeah. like she starts kind of accusing the victim of like well you didn't stop me you didn't mm -hmm. say no properly and so it's it also takes on this really very powerful and I'm pleased that they didn't um it wouldn't have this it wouldn't have the same effect if they had a male in Kathy's role mm -hmm. um it, it has a lot more power with a female asking that question because then it really makes you think about well you know why does why in society do we have things like um a culture of of victim blaming and not believing um and kind of like aligning ourselves with perpetrators and that is as as you know like as far wide ranging from things like rape culture um, mm -hmm. and kind of just general everyday sexism or, or whatever, but also to the extreme of like the Holocaust. And that's the kind of, I think that's why, like that's the parallel Abel Ferrer is trying to kind of draw, but it also is a bit clunky. Mm -hmm. I, I like it, but I also think it's clunky at times. <laughs> What do you think about Kathy's relationship to the other characters? There's a few, there's not that many super fleshed out characters throughout the film, aside from Kathy, but some of her important relationships and especially the relationship that she 
establishes with her victims, kind of they come back full circle afterwards uh, towards the end of the film. So I'm thinking especially of her thesis supervisor, her friend Jean, who's Edie, uh, played by Edie Falco, um, the anthropologist student, a couple of the other of her victims. How do you think she relates to them and also picking out the people that she attacks? Yeah, so this is the bit that I guess um, in some ways actually relates most to kind of like the sort of like a Dracula um, kind of mythology and in, in the sense of like she picks them out um, because they they have an empathy for her, I guess, or they, they kind of um, they have they show her uh, some empathy or some humanity, but she becomes parasitic. Um, mm. And and it, this is the kind of like, I guess, historically vampiric thing of like the fear of the parasitic and I think this also ties into Bram Stoker's novel with mm. its its kind of its context of fear around um se like sexuality it's fear around otherness in terms of um there was a lot of you know relation to anti-semitism things like that which I think actually also feed into this kind of especially the, the Holocaust narrative, but this mm -hmm. idea in the film of the, the bigger themes about humanity. So she picks those people because they're empathetic people. Um, they're intelligent people, all of them. She picks, you know, she doesn't pick anybody kind of, uh, yeah, she's not really interested in, in like just a, a kind of the casual snacks on people that she doesn't know. I think mm -hmm. she wants to, she wants someone to refuse her power ultimately. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, what she's actually searching for is the answer that somebody could say no to the face of evil. And there's also all this kind of religious stuff in there. Mm -hmm. So there's this idea of like, can we resist sin? Um, can somebody be brave and dominant enough? So she's she's sort of looking for that. Can And, she, and I think for, for that reason, she's picked people who she considers her equal, her intellectual mm -hmm. equal. Um, in that sense that they they're of the same caliber of her with philosophical ideas so she's thinking you know and if and if the philosophical ones can't do it maybe the anthropologist could do it right like because those are the two kind of things is that there's the tangible and then there's the theoretical and so she's sort of looking for that boundary i think every time um and hoping that well at least in maybe someone she knows and already has a relationship with that they might be the one to enact it mm -hmm. and it's interesting how you bring up the kind of her trying to find someone strong enough to control or look in the face of look in the face of evil, look in the face of sin and be able to say no, um, because the central encounter in the middle of the film where I think this question is very, very literally placed towards the viewer as well, is when she tries to attack Pena, who's played by Christopher Walken in this film, and everything is turned around on her because he is another vampire just like her, but one who has lived longer and learned to control his hunger. And the hunger for blood is referred to very openly um, as an addiction, very literally as an addiction mm -hmm. in the film. And I'll come back to that in a bit. But what do you think of this central encounter between Kathy and Pena? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. The only thing I would say is it's difficult with Christopher Walken not to be like, oh, Christopher Walken's just appeared in the movie. So <laughs> there's always that, that, and then you have to go, okay, right, no, put that to one side. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I mean, I think this is a really important and, and absolutely like crushing encounter for Kathy mm. um, because she is starting to feel powerful um, in the sense that she is starting to recognize her power relation to others and that she is always dominant in the scenario. And it takes her completely by surprise that, you know, to think that somebody else could have already not only been through this, but have gotten further. And I think in a way, like that's actually, it can be read as lots of things, but it can also be read as like a, a kind of uh, a metaphor of sorts for like the process of intellectual um, rigor in that like, you know, you do mm -hmm. a dissertation and like you think you've come up with this brilliant original idea and you've, you're like, you're really happy about it. And then you need to realize that like, well, somebody else already said it. <laughs> and like, probably actually they've got a better handle on the idea than you do. 
<laughs> and so it has this kind of echoes of like these power dynamics that she's tried to break mm. down because don't you know she's tried to take the power away from her intellectual superiors mm. you know you know her like her her friend and, and her supervisor like she's tried to kind of take that power down to mm. build herself up um but this is one encounter where she realizes that she yeah you know, she's not at the top of, of this game she doesn't have everything figured out she she doesn't know um, and I think that, you know, this is the, like, the hunger, the thirst for knowledge, right? Mm. Like this, And this goes back also to the religious question about, you know, original sin as well, is that we're, we're, this concept of humans as having this kind of insatiable thirst for knowledge. Um, and it doesn't matter, like, how much you you kind of ingest, we always want more. And, and part of that is facing the violence of humanity um, because violence is a part of human nature and it is a part of our history and mm. our collective history and our being and so there's kind of like a trying to grapple with violence but i think what this film shows is that even once she kind of does have a she thinks she's got like a, a grappling with violence she's been taught that by a different vampire right like in that seminal um scene at the start mm -hmm. and so that's what she's been given as a framework in which to understand the violence. But then she meets another really, you know, well-established vampire and realizes that, oh, there are different schools of thought on this. And that, you know, I mean, that's, there are different schools of philosophical thought on, uh, on the human condition. And I think that that ultimately is kind of like where she sort of kind of, starts to fall apart a bit is that it's like oh i thought i had it all figured out i understood mm. my philosophical alignment and i understood humanity but actually it's more complicated than that and that kind of throws her into this you know it kind of speeds things up <laughs> in terms of like what she does next <laughs> yeah it kind of throws i guess found a really interesting rewatching it this time around because the language of addiction and the language that's used around um people with drug addiction, drug addiction issues. And I think it's important to note the we haven't really talked about the context in which this film mm -hmm. was made or even Ferrara as a as a as a person who struggled with drug addiction and is particularly heroin addiction for a very long time. That is something that he he has weaved into his work and has spoken about very openly for a very long time. So the that encounter in particular and some of the ways that Pena talks about their hunger or vampirism in kind of very, very vast philosophical ways, but the language really rung as something mu much more related to perhaps the media or the public way at that time of talking about addiction issues. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that um, you're right. We haven't touched on the kind of addiction thing at all, and it isn't. You know, it's, it's called the addiction. That's Literally, a very important part of the film. <laughs> it's, it's right there on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there is this, um, you know, a desperate sense of of trying to come to terms with and understand the mm. motivations of addiction as well. Definitely. I mean, uh, you know, and again, it's kind of clunky, but you also kind of get it that like there's the reference to William Burroughs' Naked Lunch and yes. like how, you know, he thinks that that's just such a, I mean, obviously I take the character talking as Ferrara talking in this instance that he mm. thinks that Naked Lunch is such a good, um, you know, such a great kind of text for explaining how this feels and how yeah. how it is. Um, and, I, you know, I mean, I think Burroughs does quite quite a job of like dealing with his own addiction through his work. So, oh, you know, sure. there is that that probably that sense of relatability for Ferrara in, in the kind of, um, in that source material. But yeah, there's this idea of like addiction. I mean, there's so many things around addiction. Is it as a, like, as a shameful act, but also as like a personal freedom. Um, and, and there is something too about this idea of violence and freedom, like, you know, violence on the human body, your own human body, potentially mm. with your addiction or, and or the bodies of others in ter terms of trying to make other people addicted as well. I think there's really something insidious about the idea that like you're addicted, but that's not enough. You also want to make other people addicted. Um, and you know, that kind of speaks to the social nature of humans, but mm. yeah, that kind of thirst for like people understanding what addiction is. Um, but also it being so difficult to it being so difficult to communicate, I think it's interesting what you said about the media because it's so difficult to communicate addiction to someone who doesn't have addiction. Yeah, it is. And it's, uh, 
the way that Pena was talking. I mean, obviously, you know, there's there's so many ways you can read that scene into it, but I found kind of some of the language, like, uh, or his own philosophy on his addiction, on his hunger, for on his bloodlust as being something that he has managed to control, but that he knows will never go away. Um, and the way that he refers to himself as, I even wrote it down, like, uh, I'm rotting inside, but I'm not dying. Mm. and language like that where it's it's a continuous struggle as opposed to something that can ever end or something that can ever stop or be quote-unquote cured yeah um he also says demons suffer in hell um and mm. it yeah it is that sense that, i mean you know and that is true of addiction i mean addiction does not end it doesn't mm. go away it is something that you like live with if you've, you know, mm-hmm. if you've been addicted or if you are around somebody else who's, who uh, suffers addiction, it is a, a lifelong condition and it is something that you manage. And I think um, that's why that scene also f- is in some ways so heartbreaking mm. for Kathy because I don't think until that point she realized or thought about it in that way as something she will have to manage. Mm-hmm. Um, she just thought about herself as like this feeling she has right now, what she's dealing with, how powerful she feels, her relationship mm. to others. And then it's like, oh, and I think that's part of why, because, you know, it's really quite heartbreaking when she attacks Jean. I mean, you know, like mm-hmm. you, don't, you don't want, I don't know, and it's not just because it's Edie Falco, but you don't <laughs> want her to be, you're kind of like, no, she has to get away. <laughs> like, well, at least that's how I felt. I was like, no, don't take Jean. Um, yeah. But it is the thing of like, no, you need to take your friend mm. at, because you need her to understand. Um and, the, and, and that really plays out in that kind of, like, uh, party scene mm. where Jean sort of becomes, like, in service to her. Um, and it, it makes her more powerful because, and, you know, it's a sad, which I think true of addiction, is that, like, if you're addicted to something and you have a, a friend or, or something who is also addicted, mm. it, it makes your friendship and your addiction stronger. Um, and it helps you both. Uh, it, it not in a positive way, but mm-hmm. in that kind of uh, context. And so I think Kathy's desperate for that. Um, so it, I mean, you know, yeah, I think this film also does definitely show the kind of desperation of addiction, the the struggle mm-hmm. with it, and the reality of how hard it is to to manage. Because yes, it can be managed, but it's not it's not easy or enjoyable. And even mm-hmm. with um, the management of it, you know, he still he doesn't never indulge Mm -hmm. in the addiction right like it's it's there's there's a period of abstinence Mm -hmm. and again this is so religious you know there's this period of abstinence yeah but there is also still like the I guess you know the reward at the end of that abstinence you know it's like giving something up for Lent it's like this idea of well I've gone this long to prove it's quite Catholic in some ways like to prove that I um can do it I Mm. can I can be stoic but then I give in to my um, desire. And, you know, that also is a, around a kind of like religious idea about um, gluttony and lust and desire and, you know, these sins, these kind of like primal sins that are around wanting more than you should have. Because that's also what addiction is about, right? Like it's about the desire for more than you should have. Um, and that kind of should limit on things. Yes. Yes. It's the it's the indulgence. A lot of what Pena spe- speaks about in the film is about self-control and the power of will and will kind of uh, if your will is strong enough, it will you'll be able to control your bodily desires, your urges and kind of the addiction being very much a thing of the body as opposed to of the mind. So kind of that tug and pull relationship between your mental strength versus your physical weakness, which again also has a lot of Catholic connotations to it. And again, also, even as I said it out loud, kind of has a lot of rings a lot as to how um, conversations about addictions, about addiction have been treated in in the public sphere or even in in film um but i wanted to bring up really because we've been you've mentioned a couple of ideas around it and kind of at the beginning you were talking about the the philosophical and the historical weight of this film and how it brings in both a lot of concepts and a lot of authors and sometimes clunkily sometimes a little more artfully Mm -hmm. but also crucially kind of uses a lot of real life 
uh, images of atrocities from from the Holocaust and from other. I couldn't recognize all of them, but I think mm. most of them were from the Holocaust, um, which is questionable. Yeah, it is. And that's what I mean when I, I think I early on said, you mm. know, this it sort of works and it doesn't. And some people may find some of it offensive is that it, it is. Um, and it, you're right. It's not only pictures of the Holocaust, but they are the most infamous. Yeah than the most recognizable i mean i think we've we've all seen some of those images before so mm -hmm. um you know and they're you know they're the same images also used very differently in night and fog um and alan rene film so mm -hmm. they're, they're, those are those are quite powerful images because we all we collectively recognize them and it's not to dismiss some of the other atrocities that i think are alluded to and i think they're they're I'm not 100% sure, but I did see other images in there and I wasn't quite sure if they were South American or Vietnamese um, images as well. I think there was a, a few references in there too. But this idea that, um, but using those images is extremely powerful because the, the Holocaust, and not to discount any other atrocity, but more so than any other, ha has a very central place in our collective discussions. Um, and, you know, just the, 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 the use of those images in any other context, I think in any context is shocking anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those images are shocking. Well, they're, they're, they're that's the, the kind of impact of them. But I, I don't think I'm careful to kind of like, you know, suggest that I know what Abel Ferrara is thinking or his intentions, but I don't think they're intended to be used in an exploitative way, even though I think that it's fair enough if that's how you feel about them. Mm. Um, I, I think that they're intended to be used, one, like you say, to talk about that kind of role that the media plays and like how we're shown images to make us think about images that we digest in which context, why and how, like, you know, what does it mean to watch, what does it mean to watch a genre film hmm. for entertainment when the, at the core of that entertainment we're talking about things like worst violence in history, addiction, you know, pain and suffering and the like question of humanity. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's a good question to pose. Um, th there's also like, and there is a lot of relationship to the, you know, and I, again, I'm not a philosopher, so I don't know all of the subtle nuances of every philosopher that he brought in. But, you know, if you think about things like just even mentioning Heidegger, who was a Nazi sympathizer, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, in this kind of context is, telling us something about who gets to write both history and philosophical thought. So who gets to tell us the narrative or decide what the meaning of being is. Mm. Um, and, you know, she, Kathy comes to this point where she says, I'm coming to terms with my existence, applying my learning to my own being. Mm. If your learning is from philosophers who are Nazi sympathizers, Right. Like yeah. there's, a quest there's a question there as well about the role of education, mm -hmm. um, about the kind of role of, of like how who who gets to tell stories and who we listen to. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I think this is also interesting in the context of a contemporary auteur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Like in the in the kind of like sense of film history and who gets to tell stories there and who we oh, listen yeah. to as well. It's, so who, the it's who gets to write the canon and who gets to write the rules of what's good and what's bad. Absolutely. And, you know, like. They don't mention, and I, th I, I mean, this cannot be, it's not like an accident. It's, it's mm. some kind of like, but they don't mention Hannah Arendt anywhere. No, they do not, which is right? interesting because actually a lot of the, a lot of the, again, not a philosopher, so I will be butchering philosophical concepts here, but a lot of the, the questions about kind of evil and who, and how evil is perpetrated in the everyday that I think Kathy is wrestling throughout her own relationship to her addi addiction and her new status as a as a vampire, uh, whether you whoever you choose to interpret that. A lot of it can be boiled down to some of the questions that Hannah Arendt was raising. Absolutely. It's no coincidence for me that like Hannah Arendt is missing, that, they, that, that Abel Ferrara has chosen to have a female protagonist in a role that is very typically of the genre, a male character, um, to have her embody that and to have her confront things that, like I said, range from kind of rape culture to much bigger atrocities that are usually considered to be enacted by males. Mm. I'm not saying that they definitely are. I'm just saying in the kind of context of like, you know, what this is, 
what this is playing to in the you yeah. know, the sort of cultural uh, touchstones is that like she she is uh, it is an interesting choice to have that as a female character to have that in the context of like her the the yes she's bitten by a woman in the first instance but actually all the other like kind of authority figures that she comes up against are patriarchal so like her supervisor is is male her um you know her encounter uh, with Christopher Walken's character, whose name I can't pronounce properly, sorry, Pena, <laughs> Pena um, is is patriarchal. Like mm. the, you know, these are these are kind of patriarchal lineages. All of the theorists that that and the philosophers that are mentioned in the class and that are scribbled on the board are male. Um, there, there is no, and and yet there is a female philosopher whose ideas are central to everything that's going on in this film. Central to Heidegger, central to the Holocaust, central to this idea of violence and banality, central to this idea of, um, you know, how, how complicit we all are and who participates in violence. And it's not in the film. And I don't think that's an accident. Right. Like I just I don't mm -hmm. I think that he's making a commentary about that, about leaving out those voices and about the kind of, you know, the gender politics of all of these fields i mean you know the gender politics of vampirism the gender politics of philosophy the gender politics of um you know just gender in everyday life like i think he really is kind of making a commentary on that again i don't know if that's his intention mm. for sure but that definitely comes out for me and i just don't think i think it would be unusual that if you were that into your philosophy you just accidentally left out hannah Arendt. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're very deliberately including and raising uh, images from the Holocaust and raising Heidegger exactly. <laughs> into the conversation. <laughs> there is no way that he was unfamiliar with Hannah Arendt's work. Yeah. And if anything, you know, people can be bigger or lesser fans of Abel Ferrara's work, but he is always definitely an intriguing filmmaker. Like n even his worst films are fascinating to watch because they are perhaps not as deftly made, but definitely dense with ideas. Yes, that I absolutely agree with. <laughs> <laughs> and I always found personally his forays into genre to be quite interesting. Like he, some of his first films were were straight up exploitation horror films. Um, the Driller Killer and Miss 45, which I think is still probably one of the best uh, rape revenge films out there. Mm -hmm. They're fascinating yeah. to watch and rewatch. Um, but going back to the addiction, one of the things that I wanted to to chat to you about is actually that final scene, uh, not the ending exactly, but that mm -hmm. kind of post viva post um, doctoral kind of after she defends her doctoral thesis, this group attack. So this party that ends up being a savage bacchanal of some sorts where everyone led by Kathy just ends up biting everyone who's not yet a vampire yeah yeah I really felt like this scene was like um I mean it was enjoyable but I also thought it was like Abel Ferrara's way of being like I'm gonna eat my cake and have it <laughs> it's like, you know it's like I, I'm gonna do everything in this film <laughs> yeah, you I, want vampires here some vampires <laughs> I've done the lo-fi thing like now I want to have that big scene where there's lots of blood spill um mm. and and it you know in a sense it's that kind of like shocky banquet scene and I think it reminded me actually of films like Daisies you know having mm. this kind of like very extreme uh end sequence but like you say it's not the exact ending of the film but it kind of feels like the ending mm -hmm. in, a, in a sense it's like this this very climactic moment where everything spills over and erupts. And that's, you know, like the metaphor for like the violence, the addiction, whatever, it can't be contained. It just, it just can't. And, you know, it's interesting that it like, as it starts at this, before she kind of comes out, she is trying to contain herself, like in a tiny room, mm -hmm. um, but can't contain herself and must be brought someone to feast on before she can even kind of come out to the rest of the party. So, you know, it just, it it's like this idea that, that it cannot be contained. Mm -hmm. This human addiction with violence, this human addiction with destruction, with, um, with, with kind of embodying humanity and then like just annihilating it. it 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 just cannot be contained it is something that is i think he wants to say an empirical truth mm. an empirical part of being um and, and you know that's kind of like his moment on 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 reflection on the being of of humanity and yeah it's it it is really beautifully staged and very, very dramatic in a genre sense it's really enjoyable scene mm. but it it does have that kind of like um 
she seems crazed at that moment in the film. Yeah. Just, you know, she's really like, she's absolutely crazed. This is the like impossibility of, of restriction. She can't do what Pena does. She can't just control it in that way. You know, it's like, it's spilled over. It's not possible for her to let it. Um, and it's also the, you know, the questions about, I think all of these scenes always have questions about power dynamics in terms of class, in terms of aristocracy, in terms of like the cultural elite, the intellectual elite, etc. Like, you know, I mean, who is the attack on it? It's an attack on the um, university establishment. There's this really powerful moment before the feast begin begins where she is tearing at herself, tearing off her clothes mm. in this in this cupboard, just screaming, I will not submit. That That's it, isn't it? It's yeah. like this, wrestling with this addiction, wrestling mm. with this this higher power ultimately um you know and it's also like i mean the addiction is a higher power but it's no coincidence that in you know aa and in recovery Mm. that there is always talk of a higher power that you have to submit to because because like the addiction that you've submitted to you there has something has to replace it right Mm -hmm. so like but she she kind of she she's trying to but she can't submit to that higher power she Mm. you know like there's a higher power that she just is completely submitted to and one that she can't submit to i think in that moment and moving on what to the moving on to the actual ending of the film what did you make of um of kathy post the book the bloody feast and her i guess the the best way to describe it is her suicide attempt in the hospital Mm. yeah i mean What's interesting as well, because then, you know, you also have this kind of, again, this religious thing sort of comes Mm. back. And I guess it's this, I felt like I didn't really like this ending particularly, but I felt like this was kind of Ferrara's return to that question about original sin and good and evil and, you know, whether or not, I guess it's a, a religious question in some ways about whether or not you are denying who you are by controlling Mm. those impulses or if like, is like that's the right thing to do as it were do you know what I mean like mm-hmm. that's like and and I guess if you've wrestled with addiction to some degree you have to ad- ad- believe that controlling it is the right thing to do but it there's there's because it's got that religious connotation I don't know it always feels sort of slightly insidious to me like mm. is that should we all you know it's a it's a, and it is a philosophical question about whether or not you should control your impulses and what are those impulses and what effects do they have on others because addiction is something that affects you primarily but it does also affect the people around you and that's the same with you know any kind of enacting violence mm. yeah and i think the religious imagery is really drilled down in that scene in particular because there she is actually sleeping underneath a, a giant cross yeah, it was the it was the kind of body of Christ bit that I was yeah. like, ugh, you know. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, as, for me, it wasn't the like subtlest of endings. I would have preferred maybe not to have had that sequence, but I, I also get it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a, a bit of a swerve, but I did want to ask you something, kind of to as we wrap up the conversation about it. And Farrar is very associated with New York City as a filmmaker. Um, he's filmed the city in really um, kind of the, the the darkness of it and a lot of the subcultures around it. And, and a lot of this film takes place in this not quite seedy, but very, very dark n- New York nightlife, uh, which has been, you know, fodder for and background for so many films. It's one of the most cinematic cities um, on our screens. How do you think he he uses New York as a backdrop for this film? I actually really like the use of the city in this mm-hmm. film. I don't think that it has that sense of like you're not aware of it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, like so, a lot of films that are filmed in New York, you're constantly aware that it's filmed in New York. Like, yes, that they're visually reminding you every mm-hmm. thirty seconds that like this is New York. Mm-hmm. Here's something to show you that it's New York. And so mm-hmm. I quite enjoyed that. Like this film doesn't do that. I mean, it's unmistakably New York. I think in in many ways, but it's not overt. Um, it just is New York, um, and it it kind of fits with with the embodiment of Kathy, you know, her sort of like unassuming grad student who is, you know, wrestling with such a big topic and big power. Mm -hmm. This city is so big 
but it's somehow unassuming. Um, and I think that, you know, like that's also like a metaphor for addiction. Like these things are big, but they're kind of unassuming. You don't sort of notice them at first. They can go by undetected. Um, and the city is seedy, but it's also a place for projection. Again, you know, this kind of idea of these gorgeous shadows that Ferrari mm. uses, like when she's walking along the street looking for um, t where she takes blood um, out of uh, um, a guy on the street yeah. and she's sort of walking along. The shadow in that scene is like, again, 100, just so good. <laughs> like, I mean, the, 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 she's wearing this quite boxy shirt, um, or shirt jacket type thing that, creates an image of almost a hunchback on the wall. I mean, it's mm. quite amazing, like the way that the, the shadow is projected, but it's this idea again of like, well, you can project onto this city. Like the city is hard lines. It is this tangible thing, but, mm. um, but it also has the ability to have a kind of, to have like soft lines drawn onto it. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think there's something nice about also like harking back to that initial encounter mm. where it is this question about, well, what are the hard lines of the world around you mm. and what are the soft lines of the world around you? And there's lots of liminal spaces in a city like New York. And I think that those play out literally in the shadows. That's such a beautiful thought. I love it. I want a whole <laughs> sequel <laughs> to this film now that just ponders on that. Thank you so much for your time. But before we wrap up, is there anything that we haven't talked about the addiction that you wanted to bring up? No, I think we've pretty much covered it. We've covered a lot of ground, actually. I think we, we've covered all the things I was I was really eager to talk about. I mean, I, I'm sure there's more to say, but for now, that's definitely um, the majority of where my thoughts were rewatching this film. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tara, for all your time. And as always, uh, incredible insight. And where can people find more of your work online? Well, actually, you can go to tarajuda.com now. I've been reluctant to say that for months because it's been so incredibly out of date, but I've vaguely updated my website. <laughs> vaguely. Uh, it still doesn't have links to everything that I'm doing, but vaguely. I am going on it right now. <laughs> you won't find everything there, but a little bit. It's closer. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I look forward to the next one. Me too. Thanks, Anna. That's it for this episode of the Final Ghost Podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. If you can, please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really, really does help a lot. You can find out more about what we do on the Final Ghost of Code UK. Subscribe to Bloody Women there. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at the Final Ghost UK. You can also follow Tara on Twitter at Midnight Movies, and I frequently post vampire gifts at Anna B. Demented. Thank you for listening, and stay tuned for next week for a beloved 90s vampire adaptation.